really that programming side. And I think that's the next horizon. This is an amazing parking garage. Um, um, where the, was this, John? This Do one's remember? Utrecht, yeah. Okay, yeah. I keep forgetting about Utrecht. It's such yeah. a unique... They, they we're biking through an underground uh, parking garage, and to the left, you see bikes racked up. I think if I remember right, this um, garage holds between 8,000 and 10,000 bicycles. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Rob Spiller, uh, former director of transportation for the city of Austin, Texas, and now the senior vice president and national director for smart cities for the firm STV. Uh, Rob and I talk a little bit about uh, his tenure <laughs> and his journey over the past 14 years here in the city of Austin and uh, really how active transportation evolved to be a critical factor in what his department was working on. And uh, we reminisce a little bit about a study tour in 2019 uh, that I was able to tag along with in the Netherlands. And so there's some photos and some video from that. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Rob Spiller. Rob, it's so wonderful to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks, John. That's really great. I'm excited about this. <laughs> well, Rob, uh, as, since you may have uh, already listened to or watched a few of my, my uh, episodes before, uh, you know I love to have my uh, guests uh, just do a really quick uh, elevator pitch uh, overview of who they are. So who is Rob Spiller? <laughs> who am I? Well, hey, I grew up here in Central Texas in San Antonio and Austin, uh, but uh, managed to graduate uh uh, engineering school at the University of Texas right during uh, one of the big oil busts. And so ended up spending a lot of time in the West Coast and getting a graduate degree at the University of Washington and sort of happened to be in the middle of everything while the West Coast was uh, bursting at the seams. And so have been able to bring a lot of that sort of experience of rapid growth and needing to respond to uh, that rapid growth back to Austin uh, they're really quite similar cities, Austin and Seattle. They're narrow, long, thin cities, um, poorly served by major interstates. And when I say poorly served, they don't have enough connectivity to make that system work. And um, so that's how I got back to Austin. And I've worked in both the public and the private side, worked both for the cities of Seattle and for Austin. Uh, started the Austin Transportation Department here um, uh, in Central Texas uh, and built it into an organization that's uh, sort of all encompassing around operations, both uh, uh, vehicles, of course, but bicycles and pedestrian and uh, smart technologies, e-scooters and transit. We're really an amazing town that's growing so fast. We really need investments in all of our transportation systems uh, to meet the demand for bringing goods and services to Central Texas, uh, but also for moving places around or moving people around rather the various places here in Austin. You know, I've always been interested in, in um, city building or town building, uh, always wanted to work in new city development. And so now I've gone back to the private sector just recently within the last three weeks. Uh, and I'm working for uh, STV, uh, international uh, engineering firm with over 100 years of experience uh, is their smart cities director and, um, you know, really focused on not so much the technology side, but the uh, city side, solving urban problems, John, uh, you know, hopefully bringing uh, public private funds to public needs and, and solving, uh, you know, complex public problems that have been difficult to serve uh, or, or solve strictly in the public sector, but bringing some private sector monies to the process, along with those technology, the smart technologies to solve not just transportation, but, you know, think about the things that it takes a town to run, everything from water and sewer to electric to uh, transportation. Uh, many times those issues are linked because they're in the same right of way. And so as we think right. about opportunities to rebuild active transportation is their way to solve electric problems by putting in new grids, is there ways to solve communication challenges by putting in new uh, broadband and, and um, uh, you know, Wi-Fi capabilities yeah. in cities? Uh, and is there a way to generate revenue so that we can pay for those sidewalks essentially um, uh, for the city so that we don't have to burden the tax uh, payers? 
Right. That's me in a nutshell. It's not very exciting, you know. I mean, no, what can I say? Exciting. It's it's really yeah. kind of exciting. So you you just finished up nearly fourteen years with the city yeah. of Austin. Yeah. Um, reflect back. I mean, this is a, a wonderful opportunity. We're going to spend some time reflecting on a, a trip that w- you and I were, you know, yeah. on together. I was documenting uh, a, a study tour that many uh, city officials were on, and uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But take us back, you know, fourteen years ago, essentially, nearly fourteen years ago, and. And, and that transformation, because you, you, you launched, you started the, you know, yeah. you mentioned it, you founded that transportation department. That's right. Previously, yeah. it was just a public works uh, operation. So when you look back now and you look at that kind of the legacy of, you know, what has transpired over those years, what what bubbles to the top for you? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it was more than just opening up a transportation department. Um you know, here in Austin, we'd gone through sort of an environmental revolution, uh, freeway revolution uh, during the 70s uh, because there were some large highway projects being uh, deployed that were not being deployed very well or very thoughtful in terms of community impacts and environmental impacts. And so there really was a backlash here in Austin. Uh, it was common to hear people say, just don't build it, they won't come. Uh, what we forgot was that Austin and Central Texas is a really great place to live. Uh, As can be seen over the last decade and a half or two decades, we've been the fastest growing city or metropolitan area or shared that uh, notoriety, if you will, with our adjacent suburban uh, metropolitan areas. And so people were coming and we weren't taking care of them. And so the organization that I came into at the city of Austin uh, really was one that had downplayed their transportation and long range planning, their program development and their delivery process um, with sort of the false notion that if we just don't build it, they just won't come. And what we found is that we should have been arguing or debating, if you will, what we would be building, not build it or not build it. And so we should have been investing in the bicycle networks and the sidewalk networks and the transit networks uh, and the emerging type technologies to move people around. Because even in a pretty progressive community like Austin, we still need goods and services delivered. We still need uh, people to get to and from work or, or, or between workplaces and, and play places, if you will. And so um, the organization that I walked into at Public Works at the time uh, had some of the remnants of a transportation uh, operations organization. They certainly were doing uh, signals and some signs and markings. And uh, what I found is that Uh, the various elements of a transportation department were scattered throughout the city almost purposefully to uh, put them as a second thought as opposed to a first thought. So really what what I was asked to do by the city manager at the time, uh, Mark Ott, uh, was come in and and build a transportation department. Um, I had uh, been a traffic or transportation manager in Seattle and understood that you know, in a big, fast-growing city, nothing really good happens in way of transportation unless the city is deeply involved. Uh, and so one of the things we, um, uh, my organization that I put together, sort of made us a promise is we were not going to be an organization that just complained about being mistreated or complained about, you know, how awful the design was. Uh, we were going to invest our own money uh, and come to the table, not just with problem identification, but solution oriented uh, recommendations. And so, you know, when um, I started the department, there was one person, me, uh, and I started pulling these desperate, disparate groups together to um, put together back a true transportation portfolio. Uh, There was no, there were no major transportation projects in the in the region really under construction. So the first uh, line of communication we opened up was with the Texas Department of Transportation and, you know, sort of said, John, you'll remember this, that, you know, the interchanges around here, we build freeway interchanges, but don't complete them. And so we went to them and said, hey, what's up with this? You know, once you're in Austin, you can't get out because the interchanges just keep putting you back and into the, into the city. And so, those were our first projects. What we really focused on, what I really focused on was network completion. You know, this, most mature cities don't build many roads, many new roads, um, but completing that network that had not been completed for so long uh, was really where we focused. 
you know, one of the questions I always get is, uh, well, why are you investing in roadways, you know, when, when clearly your strategic plans and your investment protocol, you know, talk about active transportation, bikes and PEDs. And, you know, I'd always come back is, you know, really that's the platform for all those other amenities. We can't, you know, often uh, help land uses develop in an appropriate way unless we provide freight access and goods and movements. Uh, but that also becomes the network and the platform for the bicycle and the pedestrian environment. I, I'm glad to say that we moved that organization from that one anemic person, me, to you know an organization. I think we left at 450 uh, staff members, and, and a good portion of that was privatized, uh, which was another innovation that I tried to bring to the organization and to the city. Um, the other thing that's unique about Austin, and I think it's a, a really healthy model, is that we were an enterprise department, meaning we got no general uh, tax funds, right? right? And so that forces you to operate differently. Uh, I'm on the, uh, was, excuse me, a treasurer for the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And I'd always bring that up in groups and they all look at me like, what? You know, yeah. uh, but we had to raise all our own revenue. Uh, right. Now that was from utility fees and, and parking fees and um, permit fees. But it changed the focus because every dollar we spent on new traffic signals or new, um, you know, operating the signs and markings department, creating a healthy bicycle uh, and pedestrian environment was based on revenue that we had to generate. And so it made us yeah. very lean. Well, and, and, and at least on yeah. that operation side, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously... Yeah. Um, if we fast forward to 2014, oh, yeah. the the bicycle network uh, was yeah. uh, the bicycle master plan was was established in 2014, right. and uh, and then began like a whole series in 2016, in right. 2018, in 2020. Right. There were bonds that were that were floated out and significant right. capital dollars uh, basically yeah. being raised for the build out of these, you know, as you mentioned, these other networks, the safe yeah. systems networks and vision zero improvements and all of these things yeah. uh, to be able to really start connecting, especially the core downtown area uh, where we know that many trips are short trips and yeah, could yeah, become yeah. a bicycle trip. Well, and that was one of the innovations that we came up with. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I was blessed to inherit some really smart people. And, you know, it's not about serving every trip. You know, I yeah. mean, everybody that that um, is a bicycle hater or a transit hater, they say, well, it doesn't go where I go. And it's like, well, maybe you're expecting it to serve the wrong trip. Right. Uh, and so that was one of the innovations is that short trip, uh, whether it be work or pleasure or or. Um, to go to the store to get something was what we started focusing on. And we, we, we had some wonderful data sets because uh, data is really important, right? Uh, to be able speaking, to understand speak, where yeah, those short those trips were city, coming. You've got to have the data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, and let's yeah. put a definition on what a short trip is. When we, when we yeah. think of short trips in, you know, in the vernacular of active towns, you know, we're thinking about the, the, that trip that is inherently bikeable. So, and yeah. now with electric assist, we're now talking with electric assist. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. six miles even. So, yeah. 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 And listen, this is not easy in yeah. Austin, Texas. Everybody thinks, oh, that's great. Austin, Texas, you don't have snow. We do have snow, but you don't have to worry about long months of snow. Yeah. No, but, you know, we're, we're going through the hottest summer we've ever had, hottest right. July, uh, you yeah. know, straight triple digits. Uh, but yet the streets are crowded with bikes. I mean, there's yeah. people riding bikes. And, um, you know, a lot of that came from our inner city trips to the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, we were able to really connect with uh, people for bikes and other organizations uh, actually through the Smart Trips Challenge was my first trip to the Netherlands mm -hmm. uh, with uh, political leaders. And we were able to see communities that in the 70s made a conscious decision to go a different direction uh, than Austin and most of the U.S. did. Uh, yeah. In fact, all of the U.S. You know, as the U.S. was doubling down on the automobile, uh, many cities in the Netherlands and uh, uh, the Nordic countries said, you know, th this is bogus. We want, we got to <laughs> shift to something else, right? Right, right? And they shifted to the bicycle. And, yeah. 
you know, city after city, whether it would be Amsterdam or Oslo or Copenhagen, would show us pictures from the 70s. And I'm sorry, I don't have any of those to show. But um, where their streets were jammed like ours are now, actually with American cars, and they made a conscious decision to step away from it. And now, you know, people go to Europe because of the ambiance, the, 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 what they perceive as the lower uh, stress levels or whatever is because everybody's riding a bike. You yeah, know, I yeah. mean, if you rode a bike six miles a day or three miles a day, you, you'd feel a lot better. And, yeah. you know, well, uh, and, I'm a huge and believer I pull, I in this, electric bikes. I pulled this yeah. this photo up here to see yeah. if it would uh, uh, illustrate or, or, or generate a little smile from you. Do you recognize yeah, this? Well, yeah, of course. The, I forget which hotel this was, but so we this were... is the Carl. Is it the Carl V? Is that what it's called? Yeah. And and yeah. of course, this is in yeah. Utrecht. So when yes, Utrecht. when you think of this was the first city uh, during the 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 study tour in 2019. Yeah. And yeah. when we think of exactly what you were just saying is when you think about you know. Yeah building a city in a different way and yeah. and it's yeah. and it's not like it's anti-car you see cars no. everywhere no. you see a car yeah. right there yeah. in in yeah. the picture but yeah. you, you do talk about it's <laughs> it, it's you know it's it's a city for for people and it's a city for pooches yeah. and yeah. Yeah. and people you know find a way to get around and there's a certain sense of vibrancy yeah. to it there and is. social cohesion that that takes place now you've mentioned that you did more than one study tour. I'm going to flip through these yeah. photos, but I want you to just yeah. kind of talk a little bit about what impact those knowledge exchange visits had for you. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it, it's super important for um, government officials, city leaders, uh, county leaders, business leaders uh, to travel in a uh, study group, if you will, um, you know, I think a lot of times when people travel, they turn off their their urban planning brain. I, I always get a kick. You know, one of my best friends went to Barcelona and he got back and I was getting ready to go to Barcelona. And I asked him, what did you see really cool about transportation? He goes, I didn't see anything. I didn't bring any pictures. I came back with like 400 pictures of Barcelona, right. <laughs> you know, everything from, uh, you know, ru using rubber curbs to set off. Yeah. Uh, uh, bike lanes to a, a variety of things. And in fact, that's one of the things we imported back to Austin was the use of, um, w we created concrete, uh, we call them armadillos, <laughs> right. but concrete buttons, oversized concrete buttons to help set off right. uh, uh, bike lanes. Uh, we're using uh, rubber curbs now. And so that came directly from our experience here in Europe. Um, and then also, of course, the design we saw. But you're right. I went to Amsterdam and to Europe twice. Once was with the Smart Cities program. Uh, we Austin was a finalist in the Smart Cities program. And one of the perks of getting to the finals table was we got to travel on a diplomatic tour with Anthony Fox, not just to Amsterdam, but to Copenhagen and Oslo. Uh, and he was very interested in the bike culture and moving us towards a, a bicycle pedestrian oriented environment. Uh, but what a great opportunity for the first time to really understand is like, oh, my God, here are major cities uh, much larger than Austin, not just surviving on the bicycle, but thriving on the bicycle. And I think that is an opportunity to bring back here. The other thing that we noticed there was, you know, there's so many more cafes. There's so many more street activity. Um, I personally believe um, that COVID, the pandemic, has fundamentally changed how People want to interact with their city, um, you know, and, um, you know, any transportation professional that's watching movements of vehicles on a daily basis throughout the U.S. will tell you that the traffic has returned, but it's not the same patterns there. You know, nobody's going into work and coming back out to work on a daily basis, typically. Yeah. Um, you know, the busiest spaces in downtown Austin are, are places like WeWork and shared office spaces. And so I think... If we're going to change, I think the European sort of model of, of using the streets for other activities, cafes, gathering places, uh, interesting places to visit uh, will become much more important. Right. Uh, and so it's really super important, I think, for people to travel uh, and not turn off their 
urban planning brain or their work brain. You know, yeah. always intrigued by how many people go on a trip and go, oh, my God, Disney World was so fun. And we got on the train and we went everywhere we needed to. We didn't need a car. And yet they come back and say, oh, you know, trains will never work in whatever city they're from. Right. Um, you know, these cities made a uh, in Europe made a conscious decision to go a different direction. And that's really what it is um, here in the U.S. Um, and, you know, something I always espouse to is we need to give people that choice. Right. Uh, yeah. And in many cities and many places, people just flat out don't have a choice as to what to do. Um, and so even if they wanted to use a bike, let alone cure their kids, like we see in some of these pictures on yeah. bikes, um, it wouldn't be safe. I mean, they wouldn't feel safe. Right. Uh, and, um, and so that's what we need to change. Uh, this is really about giving everybody space on the street. Um, it is a more calm environment. We need to not worry so much about the impact to the automobile traffic and start thinking about the people that we're carrying around, whether they're in a car or on a bike or, or walking, right? And, and then work on making our spaces more fun um, to be in. Um, yeah, you and know, here in the to all ages. I mean, you know, the, yeah, the, these two photos yeah. are just are, are great yeah. illustrations. You know, yeah. being able to see some tweens, uh, you know, getting yeah. around by bike and and elderly you know, and uh, yeah. elderly and you know, just yeah. all all ages and abilities. And and yeah. I think that's one of the most exciting things that I yeah. love about what has happened here in Austin is yeah, um, is that build out. I call it the Dutch inspired. Uh, mm -hmm. cycle network and and i call it dutch inspired simply because it kind of is <laughs> you know there yeah. there the the relationship with the dutch cycling embassy going back over a decade or or a decade to the very first think bike workshop uh that mm -hmm. took place and um, the inspiration that came back and the fact that we're we're even building out a lot of the the network has that same sort of Dutch sort of red yeah. look to it, uh, which kind of works, you know, works well. It's almost burnt orange. It works it's good. Almost, yeah. It's almost unlike the Dutch orange. city. Yeah. <laughs> unlike the Dutch cities, you know, we have this really hot sun that yeah, causes yeah. all sorts of, you know, problems like break dust and fading and stuff. So yeah, yeah, no, but yeah. it's, but it's really, you know, quite yeah. extraordinary. And mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like for you to kind of, continue on with that that theme of the things that were sort of learned and how important it was not just for for you know for you know you and and, and Richard and a few of the other senior level folks to yeah. be there but also getting um, some of the the you know the politicians and some of the other key movers and shakers, representatives from like the transit authority and, and things of that nature, uh, to be part of this. And in the background, I'll just kind of have the uh, a little video playing so people can sure. kind of get an understanding as to um, some of the the really cool stuff that has been developed here in, in the Austin area. That's cool. And uh, what I want to do is, uh, so it doesn't distract you, I'll warn you what this is going to be. This is just my bike ride. I'm, I'm just going to ride from, oh, from, cool. from downtown Austin up towards Miller. And so okay. you'll get a little bit of, you know, the yeah. good, the bad and the yeah. ugly, <laughs> but most of it's yeah pretty good yeah. and uh, but i'll let well, you sort of reflect upon that you know one thing riding. you should also explain to the watchers is mm -hmm. that you know downtown to the east is fairly flat downtown yes. to the west is um you know yes. i don't know mount st helens i mean it's, well, no, it's, it's quite different yeah yeah, yeah. And when, hence the yeah. reason why having uh <laughs> you know that electric assist is going to be hugely important oh it's in huge the, in the yeah yeah, yeah. yeah we got to talk about my experience by the way because that's yeah that's going to be fun too but yeah uh, yeah and it's it's yeah so um you know it, being inspired I, I mean everyone needs a muse and i think that's really important for uh uh city folks to uh, focus on professionals and, and planners and advocates to focus on how we build this infrastructure out. Right. You know, I think the other thing is because you can get really discouraged, you know, here in the U S everybody shares pictures of their bike facilities. And I guarantee you everybody shares the best pictures, not the, right. you know, war stories and stuff. And, and there are some war stories, right? Sure. Um, you know, in Austin, uh, 
we're not, you know, transportation department, a city of Austin is, is not an autocratic environment. We yeah. operate with three or four other transportation uh, providers in the region. Uh, the transit department runs the transit. Of course, you said public works runs the or, or paves the street over. Right. Um, you know, the transportation department is really the traffic engineer gets to define what lanes get used for what kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so it really is a, a team effort and it really requires if you want something to stick. Right. Yeah. Uh, and stay around. Uh, I used to always say, listen. We are one lane conversion away from losing the whole system, right? So uh, engineers uh, and planners all over the country are converting uh, driving lanes or parking lanes to uh, bike lanes, right? And, which is a great deal uh, in Austin because there's this multiplicity of other agencies that are involved. Um, I always tried to say, listen, we got to be thoughtful every time we do it because, you know, right. you don't just lose one route one route, you lose everything if you're not careful, as we've seen uh, in several cases, yeah. uh, one here in Austin, one in San Antonio, where the state stepped in and took yeah. roads back away from us. Um, and so it's really important to bring everyone along, right? Yeah. I, I press pause here uh, just just to reflect on something. Uh, yeah. at, at this particular junction, of course, and you had mentioned it earlier, is that the pandemic yeah. sort of gave us another thing. This is uh, yeah. looking up uh, you know, a Congress. Congress. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and sort of, it went from, it went from basically cones to this yeah. interim phase, uh, until, you know, Congress Avenue gets completely redesigned. Uh, right. but it, I just wanted to reflect that, uh, just for a moment and then we'll press play again and you can continue. Um, yeah. but I also wanted to point out to the viewers and, and to the listeners mm -hmm. that, um, we were just rolling down, a street, Third Street, that had a very Dutch <laughs> looking like, uh, right. you know, protected infrastructure. Yeah. It had that. This is not that. <laughs> this one is not that, but uh, this is this is the intersection at Congress, yeah. and yeah. Uh, it, it'll it'll look different in the future. Don't worry, folks. Uh, yeah. When when yeah. Congress gets completely redone. Um, but the the real uh, I think advantage of this too is as we we press play and continue rolling uh, down Third Street here, is that yeah. this was a this was like an intentional conversion of a lot of one way streets. Uh, yeah. How long ago was that when you know these were all oh you know goodness. wide one way streets? Yeah, well, all within the last. Uh... 14 years, we See? did all of them. There you, know, you go. We did, yeah, we did. Uh, so that's huge. Uh, well, we I mean, in, you, can't, yeah. you can't just oh, brush yeah. over how no, massive that is. That's so, huge. you know, Austin had a network of one-way streets, right? Yeah. And, and it was done by uh, a traffic engineer in good faith a long time ago. You know, one-way right. streets are really good at moving people. Uh, but, you know, commerce and office buildings don't need you to move people. They need you to you know, allow people to have an opportunity. Well, and, to I guess it's fine if you don't business. want anybody to actually live there. <laughs> or stop in. and shop or yeah, whatever. Or yeah, in, yeah exactly. exactly. Move people in. Yeah. And in other words, you're right. It's, it's not about, it's not about creating a place. It's just, it, right. it's, it's a pipe. Moving people through, you know, yeah. and that was, remember that was coming out of the sixties and seventies when downtowns were not seen as, as, um, uh, assets, right? Yeah. They were seen as a, a dirty place where people went to their offices and didn't go out. Yeah. And now we have commerce, we have lunchtime activity, we have people walking around. Uh, you know, we use the right of way for business related activities. That That's really what roadways and transportation are about is, is creating opportunity for economic activity, right? Yeah. And if you're traveling at 40 or 50 miles an hour, uh, which, you know, People might be shocked. Some of our streets were signed for that speed, 40 miles an hour through downtown. Yeah. You don't generate that economic activity. Nobody at 40 miles an hour sees something in a store window and pulls right. over to buy it. Yeah. Uh, whereas I, I if call, you're walking around. I call that the magical uh, uh, fatal yeah. speed. You know, it's like yeah. it, it kills business, it kills the yeah. atmosphere, it kills people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, creating that opportunity in downtown. Uh, so, yeah, we did, let's see, one, two, three or four streets. And now they were the minor arterials to change them from one way to two way. Yeah. It was following on the big success of Cesar Chavez. You know, Cesar Chavez used to be one way uh, couplet that mm -hmm. did never work. And so that was all changed. Uh, and that was really before me, by the way, Cesar Chavez okay. happened before me. But that started this sort of 
role of, hey, we can do it. And right. so by the time I got there, there was always already discussion, but but somebody had to essentially say go. And so right. that's what we did. Uh, they were very controversial. The first ones were very controversial. In fact, the last one we turned, again, the state stepped in and stopped the last two blocks uh, of conversion oh, no. to way. That's Colorado. Okay. Uh, they had their reasons, whether yeah, they yeah. were good reasons or not. They had, they had reasons. And so, you know, sometimes it's better uh, to pick which battles you fight and yeah. move on. So we converted the street and it's working great. Used it this morning. Uh, but that also gave rise to the ability to use the center of the street, as you see here, for a rail investment and, you know, really rethink how we use streets. Pretty right. exciting uh, as we go. Yeah. Um, there's still some big streets. You know, as you know, we're coming up on I-35 here and it's getting ready to be rebuilt um, and probably depressed. And so put into a box, if you will, uh, and allow litting over it, uh, which is exciting uh, story in itself. Uh, but that will require the city to rethink some of the major arterials uh, yeah. in downtown, east, west. Uh, and those will be more difficult. You know, when we typically turn these two way, we do it over a weekend. Uh, right. And literally, it's every crew that the city can put out there to, you know, you got to you, you get all the signals ready to go, but you got to switch them over. And so it's a major effort to make happen. What's, what's fun about that though, Rob, is that I've been here for several of these conversions of, of one ways to, to two ways. And it's, yeah. it's just like, yeah, it, it's a little bit of drama that weekend. And then you go and then yeah. you're like, I, I don't even remember yeah. what it was like exactly. on the street before. It just, exactly. And, and, yeah. you know, and, it's amazing. Yeah. And many of the historic buildings or the older buildings uh, along those routes, yeah. you know, were constructed with two way streets to begin right. with. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes it a really easy conversion. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so uh, that was one thing. You know, the transit lanes on Guadalavaca were the first conversions of lanes. You know, I grew up in a in a uh, traffic sort of profession where the rule of thumb was, oh, no, you know, if you want to keep your head, don't ever convert lanes. Right. Uh, but we did that, you know, right. and now we're debating actually – uh, making a couple of streets transit only because right. as we make some new investments in the region. And, yeah. you know, I think as a community, we're now uh, uh, from a commuting and travel perspective, mature enough to go, yeah, that's the right choice. Let's yeah. just do it. Right. So, uh, you know, I had my critics that I didn't go fast enough. I had lots You're of always going to have that we were <laughs> out in front. Uh, I always felt like I was on the bleeding edge, but you yeah. know, I, I think what we've done here is really remarkable in terms of the, these assets. I think the I next hope, thing I we hope, need to I do. Hope, I hope that the viewers agree with that part yeah. of it too. This is extraordinary. Yeah. When you, when you look yeah. at. None of this was here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you know, and you talked about the capital program, the bond program. Yes. Yeah. We built most of this with bonds, right? Yeah. Uh, but when I first got to the city, the transportation bonds were in the, you know, 80 to 100,000 max. Right. When I left, um, you know, the last bond I helped put together, uh, you know, was asked by council to put a bond together. And I came back with what I thought was a, you know, doable bond. And they said, that's not bad enough, big enough. They doubled yeah. it, right? And so we were close to a billion dollars <laughs> on the last bond. And it's like, wow. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. you know, we stepped through, I actually started in 2012. We stepped through a series of bond programs um, and were very intentional about, you know, poking the political bear, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. One of those early bonds we funded, the boardwalk, right? And I don't know if you have a picture of the boardwalk here, uh, but it was an urban trail and it was, you know, historically thought of, well, that's a park asset, so you can't invest transportation dollars. And right. it's like, no, wait, it's an important commuter route right. that's missing. And yeah. so, you know, we actually invested transportation dollars, uh, got sued and the courts agreed with us, right? That yeah, no, yeah. it's a transportation asset, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, as I was leaving, we also did that with Wi-Fi infrastructure. Okay. Um, you know, the, the Secretary of Transportation just announced or recently announced that, that the internet's the last new transportation infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think we were ahead of that in, acknowledging that that the way people travel change right. changes uh, and um, you know teleworking and, and TDM is going to be super important as we go forward I don't know how we can meet uh, the Paris Accords the air quality demands uh, while at the same time keeping healthy economies if we don't 
consider teleworking and TDM as a commute mode. Right. Um, that might sound funny, but you know what? When, when we plan our cities, the trip TDM trip or the telework trip is the trip not taken. And so right. it's not accounted for in the total transportation portfolio. Uh, and I would dare say very few transportation organizations think of investing in, you know, telecommunications as a transportation tool. You know, during our snowpocalypse of last year when the city shut down for four days um, or during the pandemic, you know, there were school districts here. You know, Austin's widely touted as one of the most wired cities in the country. Yeah. But yet school districts were still having to put hot spots on school buses and drive them out and park them in certain neighborhoods yeah. so that the kids could connect to classes. Um, I applaud the sort of ingenuity, but I also it's embarrassing that here in the most wired city in the country, yeah. um, you know, we still had to do that. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, and, we and need we, to increasingly think about how we use our assets for multiple things. And yeah. so allowing transportation dollars to pay for telecommunication capabilities on our signal poles or our light poles or whatever um, isn't just a nice thing to have. It's, it's critically important to our transportation portfolio. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's an interesting thing because, you know, the pandemic obviously really changed the nature of what uh, the commute is and what yeah. the commute, you know, and yeah. who knows for the future, there may be this really, really flexible type of, of situation of, of how work, uh, yeah. how people get to and how people do work. And so right. it puts even more emphasis on all of those other trips, all of those other potentially short trips and having right. that net, that network of active mobility and transit, you know, connectivity and less of an emphasis on just the, the commute trip, but it's like right. all of those other trips that take place. It's all those other trips. It, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, our transportation strategy at the city of Austin always was all of the above Yeah, <laughs> because we were catching up for you know, 20 years of, of essentially neglect. Right. Now, listen, I, I'm a huge environmentalist and I believe technology can address the environmental challenges that we face. Um, you know, moving to electric fleets will dramatically change the, not just the air quality, but the water quality uh, challenges that we face. And so, um, you know, that's why I'm excited about new electric personal mobility that that's blooming all over the country and certainly has been the talk of the town here in Austin yeah. uh, and bikes as well. And, you know, anytime yeah, I'm obviously uh, I'm, I'm super excited about the, yeah. the empowerment of the, of the e-bike electric assist bike, um, yeah. the, the footprint and the, uh, the impact on, you know, the environment uh, yeah. in particular is so much less, you know, in, in yes. that particular e-mobility device, you yes. know, compared to an incredibly heavy, uh, you know, electric vehicle that although yes we're we're being relieved of the tailpipe emissions um the certainly the particulate matter off the of tires and and off of brake pads is is still a a, a sure. condition and you just you know you still have physics <laughs> you know for for safety yeah. perspective these are massive massive vehicles and mm -hmm. uh and then and then you still have the speed and 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 the yeah. impact on uh, us soft squishy bodies that are out there um wow. i want to roll just a little bit of video from uh the new community that uh, used to be the airport and because it highlights some more of this this kind of uh, European inspired and Dutch inspired design, and this is important because this is when we think of you know the the clamoring of having new housing being built, and there's a housing crunch for so many neighborhoods, for so many cities around the world and and across North America, and this is an example of a community that is able to. Uh, be, basically be born from the ground up of what used to be tarmac and right. create a, uh, a pattern of living that's much different than what we typically see. Right. A lot of this took place during your, your, your tenure. Talk, talk a little bit about this experience, seeing this, this happen and, and, uh, and, and really it's got to make you smile whenever you visit, <laughs> go up to Miller. Yeah, and see yeah. And I cannot take so much credit for, for Miller, but we certainly turned to Miller 
as an example. And, and you know, I, I think Miller taught us that um, it's not just about demanding roads be narrower. We have to think about all the other services that have to interact there right. and, and understand that, that we have to make uh, choices about you know, yes, it might make it more expensive to, to sweep the streets or get the garbage or whatever. Uh, and, and again, getting back to Europe, that's where we can go for an understanding of how they've done it. Because, you yeah. know, they're working on, in many cases, medieval streets. And I know you have some pictures you can show later. later. But go on to Miller. Um, you know, this is a, 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 an amazing community. It's probably the most dense new urban community uh, in Austin. Uh, Miller was the old airport Spell Mueller if you're if you're yeah. doing it online, but we all say Miller. Um, uh, it, it's really built with those narrow streets, wide sidewalks, uh, really with a focus to get people to walk. Uh, this is dedicated to a bike, bicycle track that yeah. was uh, created as part of that. Yeah, um, we used to point to this neighborhood because we, even though it has the narrowest uh, streets and. and um, had challenges with the fire marshal getting it uh, approved. It also has the best emergency response times, uh, mostly because uh, the community um, had a local fire station, emergency management station right in the neighborhood. And, yeah. you know, that was always held up as well. You can't count that because that's, you know, they got their own fire station. It's like, exactly. So if you're going to build more dense and narrower streets, you can't just think about the transportation. You got to think about yeah. the, fire and life and emergency and how people get there. And then, you know, as soon as we convince the, the uh, building official, the fire marshal, you know, then our uh, resource recovery folks, professionals would come and say, but we can't get in there with the cars parked on both sides. You know, we can't get the garbage. And it's yeah. like, okay, but you know what? Other cities have figured that out with snow plowing. They tell you once a yeah. week, you can't park on this side of the street. I mean, there's other things that could be done. Um, but you don't realize that unless you've traveled to other places with a work brain still engaged, um, uh, yeah. you know, to see that and, and to recognize, oh, my gosh, you know, Europe has streets, you know, 12 feet wide in some places and they still manage to get they ambulances. Still, they still down manage to do stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, this, so is a, you, this is a small yeah. street sweeper in Amsterdam. Street sweeper. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think this is in Oslo, by the way. Uh, no, it, it is Amsterdam. I, I see the, the okay. telltale three X's there. That's their, their symbol <laughs> for the city I believe. of, okay, of that's Amsterdam. Excellent. Yes, I see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is in Amsterdam. And then uh, uh, this maybe. This is in, I think, uh, one of the other cities I traveled to. It yeah. might be Bruges. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so again, this, is the fun, this is the fun part here because some of this was actual vacation. And so you're whipping oh, out yeah. your phone oh, and yeah. taking yeah. photos yeah. of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And my wife my, is like, my significant other has gotten used to me taking pictures of geeky <laughs> things. I am a gearhead. I'm a recovering truck engineer. This is a trash truck. This yeah. is amazing. You know, yeah. this is a trash truck. Now, yeah. here's what else is amazing is in yeah. the background, you see bollards. I see them. Um, those bollards are retractable. They exactly. are managed by a traffic management center. And so the whole inside, um, I actually think this is uh, Den Haag, The Hague, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, uh, you know, they control pedestrians on the whole district on the inside because there's not the pedestrians, but cars. Yeah. There's so many pedestrians. But they also realize that city services have to get in there. People who live yeah. along here who have, you know, a vehicle need to get in here. And so they have a credentialing process yeah. um, for vehicles to get past there. Um, yeah. And uh, but, you know, this vehicle, it, it looks like a small vehicle and and you know, this obviously requires them to then probably transfer that trash to larger trucks somewhere else. Uh, but it's, it's remarkably effective. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, fire is one of those big issues. One of the, one of the, the best trips we took was the one to Amsterdam and we talked our way into a firehouse without prior reservations. So we took the fire chief and, uh, this is a, a European style, um, fire truck. Yep. And, you know, our fire chief was suspicious that they didn't go to fires with enough people or yeah. enough water or enough whatever. Um, their fire truck carries more firefighters to a fire than ours does. I think it carried yep. seven or eight. I don't know where, but they fit in there. <laughs> They're hanging uh, off the sides. <laughs> yeah. It carries more yeah. water. Uh, 
you know, because we had to do the conversion from obviously metric to, to, yeah. to English units and its ladders go higher. Yeah. And so not, this is not a ladder truck, but one we saw, uh, the night before. Yeah. And, you know, it was such an eye opener because our fire chief had not had the opportunity really, you know, or the luxury to do the analysis of what else is. You can't get these vehicles in the U.S. I mean, and these are made by major manufacturers, whether they be Volvo or uh, there's a Japanese version as well. Probably can't get them in the U.S. because of they our are coming. current laws. I yeah, think they, it's wonderful. Yeah, they yeah. are. They are coming. And and I, yeah. I saw that uh, I think both L.A. and maybe New York yeah. uh, took delivery on small pint size uh, fire uh, engines yeah. like this. And they're yeah. electric. Yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that will start to change. Um, and, and so, again, it gets back to as we talk about active towns, yeah. we can't just think about putting out infrastructure. Right. We've, we've got to think about. The other, and when I say infrastructure, I mean bike lanes um, yeah. and sidewalks. We need to think about the whole picture. Um, right. Some cities do a better job than Austin. I'll just be honest. We've been very focused on getting infrastructure out. Uh, but other cities have, have focused on <clears throat> everything from bike storage to what do you do at a staircase? Uh, I think I gave you some pictures of that that are pretty cool. Uh, but the, really that programming side, and I think that's the next horizon. This is an amazing parking garage. Um um, where was this, John? This one's remember? Utrecht, yeah. Okay, yeah. I keep forgetting about Utrecht. It's such yeah. a unique... We're biking through an underground uh, parking garage, and to the left, you see bikes racked up. I think if I remember right, this um, garage holds between 8,000 and 10,000 bicycles. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, there's even entrepreneurs to find your bike... Um, you know, in a, a more just a corral environment, uh, <laughs> you get a geo positioning app to find your bike. And when yeah. you get close, it starts to beep at you so that, um, you know, that you're close to your bike. Um, yeah. cause all the bikes look the same over there. They don't, you know, people don't invest high dollars in most of the bikes, <laughs> exactly. meter bikes. Right. Um, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so I think we need to start focusing on those other pieces. You know, Chicago has a wonderful, uh, um, uh, a bike station there at Millennium Plaza, uh, where they actually use like uh, the racks and dry cleaners. Uh, so you you know you call for your bike and here it comes on a on a trundle around. This is when you know that bikes have hit you know <laughs> mainstream. Is when places like Hertz have bikes in their Boom. windows advertising. Uh, you know, I deliver you'd get a kick out of this one. <laughs> yeah, I love this. You know, uh, apparently you can rent the bike if you want to. From <laughs> apparently, um, yeah. Uh, but you know, thinking about how we integrate. You know, you were talking about electric bikes, yeah. and uh, not only for personal use, but use in terms of cargo bikes and delivery. Yeah, uh, I think is pretty amazing uh, because it really does extend that capabilities. Here in Austin, we allowed electric bikes to be used for. Uh, um, the bike taxis around yeah. town that can carry up to two, three people. Uh, and it really extended the capability of that whole system as a viable system. You know, when people are entertaining uh, every car we can keep out of the central areas to the benefit and the safety of uh, the individuals. And so, yeah. uh, you know, using bikes as a, as a mode of transportation, even if you're hiring someone to move you around, it's beneficial, as you said, you know, West Austin has hills, so start right in yeah. downtown. And there were just parts of Austin that those those providers couldn't get to, you know, yeah, especially yeah. if they're carrying yeah. a couple of revelers with them. So yeah. um, really now, using earlier, that new you technology. mentioned the stairs, so I want to make sure I get your, your yeah. photo Can on you that. Find that. So, so here's, so here's I, your little I, guy We here. saw these in Europe, but I've also yeah. seen them in Denver. Denver's used them. Yep. And obviously, it doesn't take a lot to figure out. There's there's a ramp, but it's longer, and most people don't want to use a ramp. Yeah. And this allows you just to roll your bike on and walk it down the stairs. What an amazing deal! Yeah. In Denver, they have a, a staircase. There's the there's the outside ten thousand version. Yeah. Of what it looks like <laughs> in um, the chaos. Yeah, Amsterdam. That's pretty crazy, right? This is where you have to use an app to find your bike. Truly, right. a smart transportation <laughs> system. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. So one of the other things, too, uh, as you mentioned, uh, one of the other photos that you sent to me, which I thought was very thoughtful, is you're you're walking around and you're thinking about all of these uh, other um, <laughs> not unintended consequences, but the other things that you need to think about. And, and this yeah. this came to mind. This is great. You. Yeah, this was amazing when I saw this, you know. 
Uh, it's an AED, an artificial defibrillator, yeah. and it's on the outside of a building, you know. And I know yeah. a lot of buildings here have them on the inside. Yeah. But, you know, if somebody's having a heart attack on the street, yeah. uh, be able to find these just like you could find a fire yeah. uh, hydrant yeah. uh, is pretty amazing. And so, again, yeah. sort of that all-encompassing, I think, to be really successful at active town infrastructure Yep. We need to think about the whole package. Yeah, it's, uh, it's what I call yeah. um, a, a activity inducing uh, activity assets. And so you have yeah. these little things that, that make yeah. life that much easier and encourage people to, to yeah. lead that, that healthy, active yeah. lifestyle. And yeah. so it is those things like, can you gain access to, yeah. to water? Can you, is there a public restroom? You know, is yeah. there an AED in case you have trouble or, right. or somebody does? And, and, and listen, so. let's be honest, heart attacks don't care if you're on a bike or in a car. Yeah. That AED is going to save you one way or the other, right? And by the way, it still is the nation's number one killer. Yeah, absolutely. Heart disease, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I guess I should say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, based on you and me, that that's something we resemble right now. We're <laughs> increasingly more important to be aware of where the AEDs are. <laughs> well, it, and, I, and I think we, we're joking about it a little bit, but at the same yeah, time, I mean, it, it is a serious matter. And it's one of the reasons why it's so incredibly important that we transform our built environments to be become more people oriented and people friendly. Uh, we now see the statistics of, of the impact of automobile noise and yeah. its impact on blood pressure and, and heart disease. Right. And so, right. you know, it's, it's really insidious that, uh, you know, kind of what we've allowed to happen within our cities to be overrun with cars to the point where right. they're having that level of negative impact on the health and well being of, our, our residents. But the good news right. is, and you mentioned it earlier, the Dutch have proven that yeah. you can reverse ways. I mean, they yeah. were yeah. choked, you know, infested with, with, with cars mm -hmm. and, and in gridlock in the 1970s. And uh, a whole variety of things happened that, that helped push them, you know, to the point where they said, no, stop, time out. We need to change yeah. our direction. And they have. And uh, one of the cities that I love that we were able to visit on that study tour was Rotterdam because we were yeah. able to experience a city that had to rebuild after World War right. II. Totally they, a new city. And yeah. a totally a new city based on the automobile. And then after about three or four decades, they're like, oops. And now they're oops. transforming it again into more people oriented. Yeah. Um, yeah. A total your, different city. And now a totally different city. Yeah. What's the city for you? that in, in thinking back um, was most inspirational for you um, and just in terms of maybe uh, changing the way that you saw the city here in Austin? Wow, that's a hard question because I find inspiration from so many cities, um, even small towns. Some of the coolest stuff I saw uh, have seen in terms of recent pedestrian Innovations were, of all places, helpful. Utah, uh, an old town, art-oriented town that they've done a wonderful pedestrian bulb and and infrastructure in the middle of town. Um, but any of the cities in Europe as well. Um, I, I think what's important is when you see something that's that's um, innovative and inspiring. Don't immediately assume it can't be done here in the U.S. You know, uh, one of the things I was thinking about before we got here. And if you've noticed, John, I'm purposefully not answering your question because I don't know how to answer that question because I get so much out of every city I go to. Uh, there's really cool stuff to see everywhere. Uh, but, um, you know, people say, well, yeah, but, you know, Europe has trains, Europe has uh, uh, great airports, Europe has bicycle facilities. All that is new since World War II. And so, you know, uh, really a lot of what we see there can be done right here in the U.S. And, you know, as you know, when we were on those study tours, we never got into a vehicle that I remember. We always either rode a train or or used a bike to get around or walked. Uh, but you can do that in places here in the U.S. Uh, you know, the Northwest Corridor, the Northeast Corridor, you can go all up and down the coast uh, using train. Uh, I, I took a group of uh, business leaders here uh, to the Northwest, to Seattle, and we, you know, flew into Seattle, took the urban 
uh, rail, light rail to our destination, to commuter rail to Vancouver, rode, you know, several different technologies in Vancouver, British Columbia, then took the train back to Portland. And so, you know, moved all around essentially a province in two states without ever having a car. And, you know, many of those folks had never done that before. And it was like so um, liberating, if you will, not yeah. to have to deal with with the car for that trip. And this is the same experience that, that, you know, I got many places, um, in Europe, uh, you know, I've been to Spain, seen amazing things in Barcelona, uh, in the small towns there, uh, seen amazing things all over the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Uh, I talked about, uh, uh Bruges, Delft has some beautiful, um, uh, examples of how they integrated art and made the pedestrian yeah. environment and, fun, you know, this right. chalk art. So it washes away with the next rain and they have to go do it again. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think the Europeans, you know, the, the thing that I, I think we can learn from the Europeans is they were very um, uh, uh, directive and very intentional in their design. And, you know, look at these surfaces. These aren't necessarily great surfaces to ride on. They're rocks, they're stones yeah. that, you know, um, uh, and I pulled this one up because it, it's the bollards. <laughs> one yeah, of the, exactly. One of the favorite things that we both love is, you know, you exactly. know this ability yeah. to, yeah. you know, to kind of do that. And, and you just yeah. kind of see how, you know, yeah. everything is integrated into, into the yeah. system here. And well, you know, bollards are a good example because we were having a conversation about bollards here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, bollards are designed to be catastrophic. They're, they're, yeah. they're designed to stop the vehicle because you're trying to protect the um, a pedestrian, right, or the, yeah. or the vulnerable user. And that's really hard for an engineer, you know, from an yeah. ethics perspective, to design something meant to be catastrophic. Yeah. Um, I think we need to increasingly think about bollards in cities like Austin and obviously yeah. in New York and L.A., I mean, I have great bollard pictures. I think I shared with you from Beverly Hills, right? Oh yeah, and no, so I've got one we, in we've here, got yeah. to use those, and we've got to get better at it. Um, yeah. So you mentioned yeah, art. I, you mentioned art in yeah, in, uh, yeah. in 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 uh, Delft. <laughs> and so you yeah. sent me this this photo of a little uh, bicycle yeah. art. Where's this at? You know, it's either in Salida, Colorado, uh, or Durango, Colorado. I really don't know. Probably Salida. Yeah. Uh, where they, I, you know, the first thing I had to look at was, well, they're storing these really nice bikes. I'd like to go rent one. But then I realized, no, no, no. This is actually what they're using as the safety um, yeah. uh, railing on railing. this structure here. It's just a some clever class. use of bicycles. Look at those. I mean, those are some yeah, aren't those beautiful old, uh, um, you know, cruiser bikes. I yeah. love it. I, you know, I think, you know, having worked in a big city, I think people um, um, mistakenly think that, well, we're so much more sophisticated than these small towns or yeah. whatever. But some of the best innovation you find, you know, it's it really is, you know, uh, uh, challenges are really the mother of innovation, right? And yeah. as, as we've oft said, and, you know, some of the best ideas um, – and by the way, to anyone listening, anything you see in the public realm is fair game. You can steal it as long as you tell where you got it from. You right, can right. borrow it. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, South Congress, you, we talked about Congress Avenue, but South Congress uh, was a project where we reverse angle parked the mm -hmm. vehicles, right. which allowed us to put bike lanes in from a safety perspective. Um, you know, a week after we put those lanes in, uh, well, before we did it, you'd never see any cyclists on Congress unless they were really... Uh, aggressive. Uh, and then, you know, a week after I drove down there and saw families, you know, using the bike lane. Yeah. Uh, but that project had been held up for years because right. of a drainage issue, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the stormwater drain needed to be replaced. It was at capacity and that was stopping the project because no one had money for that. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually and, and here's uh, your Beverly Hills bollards right oh, there. Oh yeah, there's the Beverly Hills. Isn't that great? Look how many pedestrians <laughs> are in Beverly Hills, uh, and those bollards are protecting them, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so Rob, we're going to have to bring this to a close because yeah. I I need you to get to to work and get to that new job that you're doing. Uh, to close us out, um, yeah. why don't you sort of project forward and just say a few words about uh, what makes you excited? You know, for cities in the future in, in terms of you know, what the, what the future can be, you know, with regards yeah. to active mobility. Yeah. You know, I really think that, that from a uh, transportation technology perspective, that, that 
towns and communities and cities across the United States, across North America, across the world, ha have crossed sort of a tipping point. And I, and I don't think it is uh, heretical to talk about bicycle infrastructure in the street networks anymore. I don't think it's heretical to talk about, um, you know, improved sidewalks, not just sufficient sidewalks. You know, in downtown Austin, we strive to do what's called the Great Street, which ends up in an 18 foot wide sidewalk. And I, I think Americans are becoming more demanding of what they get out of their public realm. And so I really see a blossoming of uh, mobility opportunities. Uh, it, it's an expanding field and, and a huge opportunity uh, for young professionals to get involved in and, and really do engineering uh, and planning and, and program development. Um, you know, we need advocates, but we also need folks uh, that advocate with the understanding that, that cities are complicated places to put together and um, um, that it's not just one investment. It's, it's a number of investments that we need to think about. It's not just we need narrow streets. We need to think about the fire trucks and the you know, street sweepers and the garbage trucks that have to use those yeah. same streets to make our lives livable. So yeah. I, I think the future is bright. I, I think that, that um, uh, you know, with the new technologies, with electrification, electric assist coming out, uh, that's going to be an exciting future for um, North yeah. America, for, for Americans. Yeah. Yeah, and I just took the plunge and got an electric assist cargo bike. Uh, you got a, an electric cool. assist bike as well. How, how has that changed what, how you're approaching your rides? Well, not so much yet because it's 107 okay. degrees <laughs> hey, here in town. To be honest, that's, yeah. the, the, that's the key thing that I'm now yeah. finding myself reaching for that electric assist yeah. cargo bike yeah. to do my yeah. grocery store run. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's just a couple miles. You know, I need to make my way yeah. up to the Whole Foods, uh, you know, up at uh, Lamar and Fifth yeah. there. And yeah. I'm fortunate in that I have a, a safe yeah. all ages and abilities network that can deliver me there using yeah. a, a variety of different uh, uh, pieces of infrastructure, including the the Butler Hike and Bike Trail to get yeah. me there. Yeah. Um, but I can handle it. I can actually handle it in a, in a 170 right. degree day because of that little bit of assistance, you know, so that's the right. other thing that people don't realize is that, um, yeah. that electric assist can help, help neutralize bad weather. Right. And terrain. You and know? terrain. Yeah. That's what I was going to say is hills hills don't side. intimidate <laughs> me anymore. I live on the hilly side of town and, uh, you know, I, I take rides now and don't even think about going down the big hills, uh, into the Lost Creek community uh, that I live near. And, um, you know, I ride right back up and it doesn't even bother me. You know, I know a lot of people say, oh, electric bikes are cheating. It, it's not. Listen, it, you know, it's it's like hyperbolic skis that that you can ski on now. It adds 10 or 20 years back to your, your active life. And, yeah. you know, yeah. that's really good. It's good for yeah. health. It's good for the environment. It's good yeah. for traveling. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. If, if an electric bike is cheating, then what the heck is a car? <laughs> I know, I know, really. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. So, but no, I love yeah. it. And uh, I did something outrageous. I ordered it offline and okay. uh, had it delivered, had to put it together. Uh, you know, YouTube's a great thing <laughs> on all the missing pieces in the, in the, the, uh, an uh, engineer at heart, you're like, yeah, I can yeah. do this. <laughs> yeah. Boy, big mistake. So, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I think I called you the other day for a good bike recommendation, yeah, yeah. store recommendation. Get, so, get, yeah. get it, get it all uh, tuned yeah. up and, and, and dialed in. Yeah. Well, hey, it has yeah. been such a pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, John. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to all the listeners. This has been great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Rob Spiller. Uh, it really is quite exciting and extraordinary to be here, living here, witnessing this, and being able to document the progress that is being made here in the city. Uh, we're only about halfway done. <laughs> There's many more things that need to be done, uh, but it, it is really, really encouraging, and, and hopefully you've enjoyed this little glimpse into uh, how it has come about. And if you did enjoy it, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below. 
and uh, share it with a friend. And that is the most important thing that we can do is to get this message out to more people uh, so that we can grow this culture of activity movement. I really appreciate that. And uh, the other thing I appreciate is your support. If you can support me out on Patreon, it would be a huge help. Uh, as little as $1 a month, $2, $3, $4, $5, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, what does matter is that every little bit adds up and it helps me be able to continue to produce this content and get it out to you. So if you enjoy these videos uh, and enjoy the work that I'm putting into this, uh, please, if you're getting some value out of it, maybe enjoyment isn't the right word, maybe value is. Uh, if it's worth a buck per month, two bucks per month, five bucks per month, $10 per month, I've got a 25, I even got a 50 now. Please, uh, it helps me out a great deal. Again, patreon.com slash active towns. And the other thing that you can do to help out is pop on over to the Active Town store. Check out some of our streets are for people uh, t shirts and water bottles and other good stuff like that. Uh, again, don't make a ton of money off of that, but every little bit does add up and helps out a great deal. Plus, you're just helping spread the message about uh, streets are for people. Thank you all so very much for whatever support you're able to provide. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.